All right. Um, well, thank you all for having me. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Shapiro, uh, and the very nice introduction. Uh, so I want to make sure that we have a lot of time for questions, um, but I also just want to note, I want to start every talk in the future by being preceded by guided meditation. That's really a wonderful way to transition into, I think, the last session of a day. Um, so quickly, conflicts of interest. Uh, I, re uh, I received some funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Aside from that, I have literally not one other single conflict of interest to disclose. Um, and since healthcare policy is very political, I also wish to disclose, I do not and have not done any sort of advising or consulting of a political nature for anybody. <laughs> which may just not, which may mean they don't care about my opinion. So. A little bit about who I am and why I'm here. So I'm a health policy researcher. My expertise is in health economics. A lot of the work that I do has to do with uh, things like health insurance. I happen to do a lot of work around mental health services. Um, I am not an MS researcher in any way whatsoever. I did quite a bit of homework about MS services before coming here, but this is not a particular area of expertise of mine. I have general expertise about health policy uh, and health insurance and healthcare financing and things like that. Um, and I am fairly well informed about current issues and problems and debates in health care policy. So that's a little bit about my background and what I know about, but that's not really why I'm here. Um, the reason why I'm here is because even though I don't study MS, I do have a lot of ex experience with MS. My grandfather had MS. and. My experience growing up was basically growing up with his MS progression uh, until he passed away when I was in my early 20s. And uh, Dr. Shapiro uh, alluded to, uh, that we have some uh, weird connections. And basically, the, the weird connection is by bizarre coincidence, uh, my grandfather was the patient of Dr. Shapiro, unbeknownst to both of us, until we were on the phone with each other. So I'm really quite happy to be here today. So this is the agenda of the types of things that I was planning on talking about with all of you. Um, we're going to start with some, I would say, like high-level healthcare policy issues. Where are things at right now in healthcare policy in the United States? What's been going on? What's changing? What should we, we be looking forward to? Um, and here and there, I'll make some links to things that I think are very specific to MS. But then we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into two topics that I think are very important, particular for people with MS, which is long-term care and pharmaceutical issues. So a word about what I'm trying to do here today, though. So in my work, I generally focus on these high-level health policy type questions. That's, that's the picture of the capital, whether it's the United States capital or a state capital. And the types of questions that we typically engage with in this perspective is um, things like, hypothetically, how do we as a society decide which services people should be getting at what costs in the event that they end up having some illness or disease uh, happen to them. That's very different from the perspective around health policy from people who are actually living with diseases or illnesses. Um, and you all are the world's experts in what it means to have the lived experience of MS and dealing with getting care for MS. Um, and my view of the, the, the way that I think about the way that people with MS consider the important health policy questions, they're not about hypotheticals. These are very, very serious questions about how do we get the care that we need right now and how do we get it at a fair price. Um, so I'm going to be trying to navigate these two sides here today. Um, and as, as I'm doing that, so I'm a health economist, and what health economists do is we talk about trade-offs a lot in policy decisions. Um, and what I learned uh, today is that I actually think about trade-offs and policy decisions very much in the same way that Dr. Shapiro thinks about sexuality and vibrators, in that you got to talk about it. Like, not talking about it doesn't make it go away or doesn't make it less important. We're, these things are always happening, and the only way that we can really make progress in these really difficult discussions around policy questions and, and health care is by actually talking about it and engaging with, this thing, with these things openly. Um, the last thing I want to note here is that healthcare policy is very, very political. This, if you've been paying any attention to what's been going on in national health policy debates, you have realized this. I am not here to deliver opinions, not that I don't have opinions, but my role here is to be describing facts about healthcare policy, give some analysis about healthcare policy. Um, 
I will be touching on some political things, again, in a way that I hope is being descriptive and not giving opinion, my own political opinions. Um, and I want to be very, very clear. When I'm describing something or giving analysis about something, it's not, I'm not saying that I support something. I'm not saying that I'm involved with something. It doesn't even necessarily mean that I like the thing. I'm just trying to give lucid description of what is going on and what we can expect to be going on. So with that said, where are we in healthcare in the United States in the year 2019? So the ACA, Affordable Care Act, has been fully implemented for several years now. Um, and my read of how the ACA has done as a way of transforming our healthcare system is that it has been far, far better than the worst attractors of the ACA said it would be or says it has been. It also has not maybe been as amazing as the biggest proponents of the ACA have said that it would be. Um, but the American public at this point actually is rather supportive of the ACA, but there's still a lot of polarization. And a lot of that polarization ultimately has to do with politics, whether you are more conservative or more liberal in your political leanings. In 2016, the Republican Party gained control of the presidency and both houses of Congress in the United States Capitol. Um, and as uh, part of the promises around that political campaign was we are going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. We're going to repeal the ACA or Obamacare, however you want to call it. Um, and they attempted to do that, and it ultimately wasn't successful. However, a bunch of things have happened since then that essentially are chipping away at pieces of the ACA, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Another thing that's been going on, not necessarily in Washington, D.C., but in the healthcare system much more broadly, is that healthcare is just very, very expensive. And I think there's been greater attention to exactly how much healthcare costs, both from a societal level and for people's own checkbooks. Um, and I think two particular examples of that is there have been, there's been more and more attention to the lack of transparency about how much healthcare costs in the United States. And there's also been more and more attention to this notion of financial toxicity, that we should be thinking about how much people's healthcare costs is almost a side effect, similar to the way we think about other types of side effects of medications. Another important theme in U.S. healthcare is the theme of consolidation. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I do have a slide about it because it actually does, I think, have some very important ramifications for healthcare costs. Um, and then finally, medical innovation. And I'm going to touch on this a little bit more when we talk about pharmaceuticals, but there has been a lot of important medical innovations, particularly in the pharmaceutical sector in, uh, as it pertains to multiple sclerosis care that has been ongoing for a while and it looks like it's going to be continuing into the future. So when we think about healthcare policy, a lot of us first think about in health insurance. And one thing that we now know pretty definitively that the Affordable Care Act did do is that it really did reduce the number of people in the United States that, did not, that do not have health insurance. And that's that big drop that happens towards the right side of this graph here. This is the percentage of non-elderly adults in the U.S. that don't, or the non-elderly population in the U.S. that does not have health insurance. Since 2015, it's sort of hovered around 10%. That's a historical low as long as we have tracked these statistics in the United States. Um, so the ACA really is responsible for a lot of that. And to the extent that you think that expanding health insurance is a good thing, that, that is an important win. Where did that come from? That, a lot of that came from expansions of the Medicaid program. So Medicaid is the public insurance program for low-income populations in the United States. Each state runs its own Medicaid program. Each state has a Medicaid program. A big feature of the ACA was that it allowed states to expand their Medicaid programs to cover all people up to 138% of the federal poverty line. Many states have elected to expand their Medicaid program in this way. Many states have not. There is a pattern here. More liberal states were the ones that have elected to expand their Medicaid programs. More conservative states have chosen not to. Um, there are a few exceptions here and there, but that is the broad pattern. This also does have implications for um, health insurance coverage in these states because we know, and this has been demonstrated very, very clearly through several studies, that in states that did expand their Medicaid programs, those are the states that have had the bigger reductions in uninsurance that we've seen over the past five years to uh, five to eight years. So healthcare is very, very expensive, and this is sort of the, these are the high-level statistics about healthcare spending. So the most recent uh, data that we have available on healthcare spending in the United States is from 2017, and in 2017 we spent 3.5 trillion dollars on healthcare in the United States in that one year. That's coming close to being 18 percent of our total economy. This is, takes a really big chunk out of the federal government's budget. Takes a big chunk out of state government budgets. If you compare us to other industrialized countries, we spend far more on healthcare than other countries do. Um, 
I'm an economist, and we're supposed to be comfortable thinking about large numbers. I can't wrap my head around three, three and a half trillion dollars. The best way that I have to try to get a sense of just the magnitude of how much we spend on health care in the United States is to say that we spend $6.6 .6 million on health care in the United States every single minute. That's what adds up to $3.5 trillion a year. It's really an astronomical amount of money. Now it's, not, now, it's not wrong to spend a lot of money on health care if we think that it really is valuable for people. And the people who need services are the ones that are really getting those services, in which case, great. Maybe we should be spending that much money. Maybe we should even be spending more. The question is whether we are, as a system, really getting that value that we want. So that's the, sort of the, the Washington, D.C. policy perspective on health care costs. That's very different from the perspective of people that are actually having to deal with paying for health care themselves and, them, uh, and what the implications are for their families. So health care, out-of-pocket health care spending has been increasing very significantly. And you, you could actually, this, this is a, one example of how this is being manifested. Uh, this is looking at people who have employer-sponsored health insurance and what percentage of people with employer-sponsored health insurance have a deductible in their health care plan that is $2,000 or more. That's a pretty high deductible. There are a huge number of American families that are employed that would have a hard time coming up with $2,000 to be able to pay for health care before they hit their deductible and the other parts of their health insurance benefits start kicking in. Now, this go, so this goes from 2009 to 2018, so it's yeah, just over a quarter of, of people in this group here had this very high deductible in 2018. You could draw this line back farther. This has been a trend that has been going on for a very long time. It's not really driven by any one thing. This, isn't, this wasn't caused by the Affordable Care Act, for example. This is just caused by health insurance. Health care is very, very expensive. Health insurance is expensive because health care is expensive. But as you probably suspect, high out-of-pocket costs have consequences for people and for families. So this was, um, this is looking at nationally representative data where um, this comes from a survey and asked people about a bunch of questions about their experience with healthcare. And some of the questions they asked about were about how often you or people in your family had to do certain things that we probably think of as not being very desirable in healthcare. So these are the things on the left-hand side, the left-hand column here. Whether or not you postponed or put off care, whether you treated yourself at home instead of seeing the doctor, whether you avoided doctor-recommended tests or treatments, whether you did not fill a prescription or skipped doses of a prescription. In a well-functioning healthcare system, we would like to think that those things are happening very rarely, if ever. However, they are happening pretty frequently in the United States. The left-hand column is looking at families that don't have any chronic conditions whatsoever, even in families without chronic conditions. 40% of, of people reported having to do at least one of those things in the past year. Let's look at families with chronic conditions. MS is a great example of a chronic condition. 60% of people responded that someone in their family in the past year had to do one of those four things. Let's look at the right-hand column here, people with chronic conditions who are in health care plans that have high deductibles. Three quarters of people in these plans uh, with chronic conditions are reporting that they are doing these things that we really think we shouldn't be seeing in our health care system. So out-of-pocket costs really do have significant consequences for people's access and use of appropriate and important health care services. Public opinion around health care costs is really interesting. And, and that, so I, I pulled this from an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine two days ago that was pulling together a whole bunch of survey data about how people, how Americans think about the costs of health care and what we should do about it. And the first bullet point here I think is really interesting. It's nearly unanimous that Americans think that health care costs too much. However, it's also nearly unanimous that Americans think that we should be spending more as a country on health care. Now there's, I think, a pretty obvious tension here, and this is sort of one of these issues of trade-offs when we talk about health care policy. Um, we really want to be protecting people from the high cost of health care when they really need it, um, and we want to make sure that people are, we have enough resources that are going to the people that need it. On the other hand, it's very, very expensive. In terms of specific things that people are interested in, uh, there's very strong support for having low drug prices, there's very strong support for protecting coverage for pre-existing conditions, um, and there's also very strong support for protecting Medicare benefits in particular. When you ask people about who to blame for health care costs, there are a few groups that get a lot of fingers pointed at them. 
Um, and they're actually, this is an order of the, uh, from most to uh, least, but these are all, these are, this is still the group that gets them, the three groups that get the most blame, and in order, it's pharmaceutical manufacturers, followed by health insurers, followed by hospitals. There are a lot of pe people that point the blame at those three groups for why we have such high health care spending in the United States. What I, the other thing I think is really interesting from when you collect all of this public opinion data about healthcare spending is that you see majority, strong pluralities, if not actual majorities of Americans, really so are open to a very broad range of solutions to try to deal with high healthcare spending in the United States, ranging from really government focused solutions to private sector solutions and to all the different specific combinations that are in those broad categories. And what I learned from that and what I read from that is that the American public really is quite open and receptive right now to creative thinking and potentially significant action to try to bring down the cost of healthcare for families. So I'm only going to, I'm not going to dive too deep into this, but there has been this ongoing trend for a very long time of having more and more what we call consolidation in the healthcare system, both in terms of the health insurance system, but also the healthcare delivery system itself, which is essentially about mergers. So we have health insurance companies merging with health insurance companies. We have, so recently we've had this big merger of a health insurance company, Aetna, merging with the, pharm uh, the pharmacy giant CVS. Um, we also have hospitals merging with hospitals, or merging with their hospital systems merging with hospital systems, hospital systems merging with physician groups. All of this is ultimately creating more consolidation in healthcare and also less competition. Why is this important? It's not like I think that uh, I'm, it's not that I need to like recite the Wall Street Journal to all of you, but this actually does have consequences. The best evidence on the implications of these trends is that they are, in, they are part of the reason why we have high costs of healthcare. And in addition, there's really very, very little evidence that this, these trends are leading to improved quality of care. And if anything, most of the evidence suggests that more, this, these trends toward more consolidation is leading to poorer quality of care. All right, so what's been going on in federal health policy? So as I mentioned before, after Republicans gained control of the presidency in both houses of Congress, um, there was a significant attempt, a very serious attempt, to essentially repeal the Affordable Care Act. It was repeal and replace. Um, and the major legislative effort to do that was not successful. This was when John McCain, uh, Senator uh, John McCain famously gave his thumbs down and said, I'm not going to vote for this. And that was the deciding vote, which caused the ACA to not be repealed. Um, but that said, there have been a bunch of things that have been successful in the sense of trying to at least chip away or undermine parts of the ACA. So for example, the ACA had a mandate that people carry health insurance. And um, one, th one successful thing that the Republicans were able to do in, in, their, in a, the big tax reform law was essentially get rid of that mandate. Um, get rid of the, technically just get rid of the tax penalty, but that's essentially getting rid of the mandate. Um, the other things that have been going on is there have been a lot of regulatory changes that the Trump administration has been pushing um, around things like uh, what are called association health plans or short-term health plans. And what this is essentially about is these are different types of health plans that are not subject to insurance regulations that the ACA put in place for or what health insurance is supposed to look like, saying like, you have to cover the set of comprehensive services, you're not allowed to deny services on the basis of pre-existing conditions, you're not allowed to charge people higher premiums based on their pre-existing conditions, things like that. These plans are not subject to those regulations. So in some ways, by, by expanding these types of plans, association health plans and short-term plans, it's almost sort of like an end run around what the ACA did to try to bring health insurance options um, back that were more common in the pre-Affordable Care Act world. Since the 2018 election, when the Democrats took control of the House of Representatives, we're basically at a stalemate for the big picture health reform issues, simply because Democrats and Republicans on big picture health reform issues are very, very far apart from each other. Nothing is going to get passed in any direction in terms of the really big ticket items. That said, there is still some interest, and I think potential for movement and promise on certain areas where there is bipartisanship. Uh, so some examples here are issues around surprise hospital bills, um, there's a lot of interest in opioids, and just prescription drug costs in general. I think that those are, we see some promise there for some possibility of moving forward in a bipartisan fashion. I do think, though, that much more interesting stuff has been happening at the state policy level. And what has been going on at the state policy level really depends on what state you're in and what is the political leaning of your state. Conservative states um, have been still largely uh, rejecting the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion. Um, what's been interesting, though, is in, in the last election, 
several states actually put directly on the ballot, should we expand our Medicaid program? And in several pretty conservative states, the voters said a pretty resounding yes, which is a little bit surprising because these, these again, these are fairly conservative states, like Idaho, for example. Um, and since then, the state legislatures have been complying with those uh, the, the voters' wishes to a varying degree. Um, the other things that have been going on in conservative states are there have been there has been a movement to try to adopt more conservative health policy views. These are not new ideas, but under the Trump administration, there's sort of been more of a green light to pursue these th types of things. And the big examples, I think, are in the Medicaid program. So again, the, low in uh, the public insurance program for low-income populations. These are things like requiring that people are working or doing some sort of documented, um, like say, community service activity in order to qualify for Medicaid benefits. Um, and several states have tried to pursue that, not terribly successfully so far, or potentially block granting the Medicaid program, which is just changing the way that the Medicaid program works from an open-ended commitment of the federal government is going to say, we will continue to, to subsidize state Medicaid programs, no matter how much it costs, to saying there's going to be a fixed amount of money and it's not going to increase that much in the future, and that's going to force states to essentially make some tough decisions about what will be covered in Medicaid or who will be covered in Medicaid. In more liberal states, it's been a very different story. The, the state policy efforts have been more around trying to strengthen and shore up parts of the Affordable Care Act that in some ways have been undermined by some of the Trump administration's uh, regulations, um, and also some other attempts to just expand health care coverage. And what I think is the really interesting thing here is uh, the, the use of the so-called public option. So basically, having a state level, a state public insurance plan that can be open to anybody. That would basically be sold alongside private insurance plans on individual health insurance marketplaces. Washington State actually is one of the states that has been leading on this so far. So what should we be expecting over the next couple of years? I've used, I think, I think this is, we have three political camps at this point. We have the Trump administration and the rest of the Republican Party. And I think that we've sort of seen what they are going to be trying to be pushing on the political and the health policy scene. They are still interested in repealing the Affordable Care Act. They're trying to reduce regulations wherever possible and restrict insurance benefits, uh, restrict public insurance benefits like the Medicaid program and potentially the Medicare program. Um, and the, the, the rhetoric from the GOP for a while has been repeal and replace the ACA. And I think that it's important to note that they, they've tried the repeal, but there still hasn't really been a, a clear coalescence around what replacing the ACA would look like. Because as we saw from a couple years ago when there was this big push to repeal the ACA, a lot of the American public really, really does like, even if they don't like certain parts of the ACA, there are parts of it they really, really like a lot, like protection of coverage or pre-existing conditions, I think, is the poster child for that. And it's really, really hard to try to totally change, repeat, get rid of the ACA while trying to keep those things that people like without sort of throwing the entire system into a, a, a bigger mess than it currently is. Um, that's a challenge that I think it, it still exists for Republican health policy strategists right now. They really haven't figured out how to craft that. Um, in the, the more liberal side, I, I, I see a difference between the centrist Democrats and more liberal Democrats. Centrist Democrats are really try, are rallying around ways that we can build on the Affordable Care Act. Um, and think about more incremental ways to improve health care coverage, whereas more liberal Democrats are really rallying around this notion of single-payer health insurance, Medicare for all type plans. And all this is going to be playing out over the next you know, 12 to 18 months or so as we have the, the, the Democratic primary to see who's going to be running in the presidential election. And I think these issues are going to play very prominently. So what else should we be looking, uh, thinking about here? So there, again, there are, I think, areas of bipartisan agreement where we have the potential to see some interesting movement in health policy. Um, I think that there is a commitment on both sides of the, of the political aisle to have more, com uh, more competition in healthcare markets, hoping that that will reduce costs and potentially improve quality of care. There's big, big pushes for more transparency in healthcare prices and ending these practices of surprise billing. I think that we're going to see, I think, I will not be surprised to actually see laws get passed around those three areas in the next six months. But again, I think that most of the interesting health policy issues are gonna, uh, movement is gonna be happening at the state level for some time, um, because I think we're just going to have a lot of gridlock at the federal government for a while. Um, so I gave an example already of these state public option plans. I think it remains to be seen whether or not they will be really successful in reducing healthcare costs for people, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, so far, Washington, and Washington State and Colorado have been leading on that. I think other states, I know other states are very, very interested. And this is, this is a, a sort of an open question. This could help a lot. It might not make much of a difference. 
we're going to be learning a lot in the next few years about that. Um, and then another thing at the state level is consumer protection laws. So where there has been deregulation from the Trump administration around certain types of consumer protections in health care, um, uh, states have been, at least more liberal states, ha have been moving in to try to fill that void. And I think we're going to continue to see some of that because we know Americans, regardless of their political orientation, are still very much in favor of a lot of these consumer protections. So for example, making sure that pre-existing conditions are covered. Okay, so now two specific issues. The first is long-term care. Uh, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on long-term care, um, but this is a very, very big issue for people who have MS and for their families because disability is an important consequence of MS and long-term care is one of the key ways that we manage disability. The biggest payer of long-term care services in the country is the Medicaid program. Um, and I feel like I'm always obligated to note in any time I give a talk about long-term care or disability, the Medicare program does not cover long-term care services. It covers some things that sound a little bit similar to long-term care services, but the Medicare program does not cover long-term care services. This is largely being paid for by the Medicaid program. There are some people who have private long-term insurance plans that help pay for long-term care, but not too many to be honest. These plans are not that common or that popular. Um, and otherwise, it's families trying to scramble to cover the cost of long-term care, whether it's families helping each other out directly with delivering long-term care services or scraping resources together to pay for somebody else to help out with long-term care services. I, I take actually a very strong view that this has been for a very long time the biggest failing of US healthcare policy. We have not taken on the issue of how do we pay for long-term care uh, in the United States in a way that is equitable at all, um, because this is something that really does cost families a very significant amount of time and resources over a very, very long period of time. We have not grappled with how we pay for this. So what are the possibilities for improvement here? Um, at the federal level, there's not going to be anything that is happening at least until 2020, if not later than that. One thing that I want to come back to that I mentioned earlier is that there has been this movement in the Medicaid program that is being, uh, and this has really come, this has been a, an idea that is not new. This is a conservative health policy idea that we should be using block grants for the Medicaid program as a way to control spending in the Medicaid program. And so that, again, this is basically saying instead of the federal government having an open-ended commitment to pay for as much money as states are, are basically spending, for their Medicaid programs, saying you're gonna get a fixed amount of money and the state has to figure out how to use that. And that will definitely save money. If we're worried about trying to reduce how much we spend on Medicaid, it absolutely will do that. But the way it's going to do that, it's, it's that states are going to have to make decisions about, we're going to have to cut back on some things. Either we're going to have to cut back on some of the services that we deliver, or we're going to have to decide we're going to cover fewer people via Medicaid. And when long-term care services are comprising a huge, huge chunk of state Medicaid budgets, when, when I think about block grants and their implications in the future, there's no way of ignoring the fact that that's going to be affecting the future of long-term care services that are financed by the Medicaid program. On the other side of the political aisle, the more liberal side, um, where we have discussions about single-payer health care. Something that's interesting about single-payer is that single-payer is not a new idea. It's been around for a long time. There have been vocal advocates for a, it for a long time. But when we have seen actual proposals for single-payer health care historically, they typically haven't talked about long-term care. It's sort of been missing from those discussions. That has changed, actually. In the past year, some of the prominent backers of single-payer Plan. So, for example, Senator Bernie Sanders um, is, a, is a very prominent uh, proponent of single-payer health care in the United States, uh, has incorporated long-term care coverage into his single-payer plan. This is new and I think is important because it's something that you can't ignore it. Um, again, at the state level is I think where we're going to see a lot of the really interesting changes happening. And again, it's just coincidental that we are here in Washington State right now, which is where we, I think we just saw the most interesting thing happen in long-term care policy in a very long time. Washington State just a few months ago passed a law that creates a public long-term care insurance program and also creates the mechanism for funding it via taxes. Um, this is the first of its kind in the country. And the question is going to be, A, is this really going to be sustainable? Will it work? to actually deliver benefits to people who need them in a, in a way that is going to not break the bank for the state? And B, are other states going to build off of this and, and try to pass their own versions of it? I think it's entirely possible, um, but I'm very, very encouraged to, that this is even just in the policy discussion right now because 
for way too long, it's just getting ignored. And it can't be ignored because this is something that has a huge toll on families. Um, and the key thing about long-term care is that it's not like we need innovation here. It's not like there's gonna be some blockbuster drug that will allow us to deal with long-term care in a much more cheaper or efficient way than we've been doing. That simply doesn't, that's not the way long-term care works. Long-term care is just fundamentally about you need to have people that are going to dedicate the time and effort to be helping other people who are experiencing disabilities. You can't make that much more efficient. This isn't about making our system more efficient. It's about this is costing a whole lot of time and money and mental energy and emotional energy for for people with disabilities and for their caregivers. And we have to think about what is the way that we actually support that as a society in a way that is sustainable and in a way that we think is equitable or fair. All right, we're gonna move on to pharmaceuticals now. And we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good is that, and, the, and some of the other speakers have, have talked about this, there has actually been a tremendous amount of innovation and that have led to improvements in treatment of MS. That's a really fantastic thing. Um, as I was talking with Dr. Shapiro before, like when my grandfather was, when he was treating my grandfather, there were not some of the treatment, uh, most of the treatment options literally did not exist then. And these are things that we now know actually really do have a very substantial um, benefit for people with MS. So that's great. The pipeline looks like we are going to continue to have more innovation in MS treatments. Also, great. The bad. Drugs are really, really expensive. Drug prices for MS drugs and specialty drugs and sort of in general are very high. They are also rising. Now, drugs that are new and are still on patent are sort of, as a rule, expensive. And the way, that's the way that we incentivize new drugs being created. It takes a tremendous amount of time and resources to develop new drugs and put them through the, all the testing that's required. Um, and the reason why drug manufacturers go through all that and take on a lot of financial risk is because there's this potential financial reward at the end, which is that you're going to be able to sell your drug on patent for a lot of money. And that actually is, we know, a pretty effective way of, create, of getting a, a pipeline of new drugs. Um, however, we're it's not just the drugs that are right, just coming, newly coming onto the market that are very, very expensive. It's other drugs that have been on the market for a while where we're also seeing these big price increases, especially for MS drugs. So that's the bad. What's the ugly here? It has to do with the trade-offs. So on the one hand, we're really, really worried about the high cost of prescription drugs for MS, um, and we know that they are taking a huge financial toll on families, um, but if, and there are things that we could do that would really bring down those costs and the, the, the price of drugs and the cost of drugs. However, if it, we do that in such a way that it's potentially less profitable for drug manufacturers, that could have a chilling effect on what the future pipeline of innovation looks like. Now, I'm not saying that if, if we make some policy changes that drug manufacturers are just going to shut down. That's not going to happen. But we have to be mindful that, um, that drug manufacturers are, in fact, paying attention to what is going on with drug prices and that it does in fact influence the amount of investment that goes into the development of new drugs and in MS we really still need new drugs it's not like we've conquered everything like far from it we really still need new drugs coming online but pharmaceuticals are sort of a mess so this is a schematic of what our pharmaceutical system looks like um, and involves manufa drug manufacturers at the top of here. We have pharmace uh, pharmacy benefit manufacturers. We have the, the health insurance plans. We have drug wholesalers. We have pharmacies. And then in the, the bottom right corner, we have the actual people that are, end up taking the drugs. Um, and where we have things that are complicated and we have a system that we think is very, very expensive and not making sense, it's really easy to point fingers at everybody. And when there are debates about what's going on and what's, what's right and what's wrong with pharmaceutical policy, in the United States and, and the really high cost of drugs, what happens is that every single box here points fingers at every other box. Um, and to be honest, it, it, every one of these boxes probably has some responsibility for high health care, for the co high cost of drugs. Um, the, the best analysis that I've seen, if, if we're thinking that some of the high cost of drugs is just straight up profit that's going to Manu uh, to, to different parts of the industries here. Uh, the best analysis I've seen is that it is drug manufacturers that are getting the biggest chunk of profits out of here. Um, it's not that there aren't profits that are being made in other parts, but that is where the biggest chunk uh, is going. On the other hand, it also is the drug manufacturers that are taking on a lot of financial risk when they are developing new drugs, and I mean to the tune of billions of dollars. And we probably want there to be, it's not that we don't want there to be profit, 
the question is whether or not this is really excessive profit, and it's profit that's coming not from delivering really good drugs to people that really value them. And as we, and as, and we as a society say, we want to pay for those things because it's going to really help people out. That's good innovation as opposed to drugs that really maybe aren't that beneficial compared to what we already have but are still really expensive, or drug manufacturers basically engaging in what in the health policy world we just call shenanigans to try to inflate the prices that they are charging. MS drugs are simply very, very expensive. There's no way of getting around that. And the prices of MS drugs have been rising very, very steeply. If you look at how much money people have been spending out of pocket on MS drugs, this has been rising really steeply. This is an analysis that was published just a few months ago in the journal Neurology. And this is about two things that are going on here. One of the things that are going on is that out of pocket costs in healthcare in general are getting more expensive. So this is people are facing more and more deductibles over this period of time, for example. That's part of it. The other side of this equation is just that drug prices have been going up. When you put these two things together, you get this really, really nasty increase that is coming out of the pockets and the bank accounts of people with MS. Also, we should be talking about what's going on on the insurance side when we talk about drug coverage. So insurers respond to have facing high drug prices in a few ways, and some of the biggest things that they do have to do with how they design their drug benefits. So for example, using tiered formularies, using step therapy protocols, or requiring that people, that patients have prior authorization before the insurer will actually cover a certain drug. Um, there are two different views of these types of things. The sorry, it's back. Okay, so the view of what I would say for the average person who does not have a significant health condition of, about these types of, of drug, uh, of drug uh, in, uh, health insurance drug design, uh, insurance design features is that no big deal. These things probably make my health insurance premiums lower. However, my sort of my telepathic sense of, of what it's like from the perspective of an MS patient is to paraphrase, these things are utterly miserable and totally unfair. Um, so, I think it's important to note though, why is it that insurers are doing this? Insurers are not doing this because they like being totally unfair and making people's lives miserable. They're largely doing this, as, so especially with respect to tiered formularies, um, where you, like, you have to start with, uh, where there's a, a cheap drug in the, the tier one, and then more expensive drugs and more expensive drugs as you go up the tiers. That allows them to have bargaining leverage with drug manufacturers. Basically, a, an insurer says, we are going to put your drug in tier one, but you have to give us a really, really good price. And that's just a way that insurers are able to just get some bargaining power to extract a lower price. For things like step therapy and prior authorization, in theory, these aren't necessarily bad things under a certain set of conditions, which are that if there is some sort of therapy that exists that is relatively inexpensive and is broadly effective for most of the population, if under those conditions, it's maybe not a bad thing to have something like step therapy or prior authorization where you have to start with that cheap, broadly effective thing before you move on to the really expensive specialty drugs. However, those conditions do not hold for MS. Yet, we still see all of these insurance design features being used for MS drugs, and that is a really significant problem. Um, another thing that insurers do sometimes is you design your insurance plan uh, benefits so that they are not going to be attractive to MS patients so you don't have MS patients enroll in your plan. The Affordable Care Act did a bunch of things to try to make that harder to do in general, not around MS, but just sort of around expensive populations to care for in general. I think it did help. Was it perfect? Probably not. So what can we actually do about high drug prices? And I think it's important to note, for MS, we are in a fundamentally tough situation here. So the, the list prices, which for it's not really the true price because there's also a lot of rebates that happen, but um, it's still important in some ways. List prices of MS drugs have gone up a whole lot over the past 10 years. That actually it, it has really big ramifications if you are a Medicare beneficiary because the coinsurance that you pay is based off of these list prices. So your coinsurance payments have been going up a whole lot over time because of these list prices have been going up. So for MS, this is, this is just not a situation that is conducive to the normal market mechanisms that we've relied on in the United States to try to keep drugs affordable. We need other solutions here. So what can we do? We can try to encourage more generic and biosimilar competition. That likely will help, but you have to have drugs come off patent first for that to happen. We can change policies so that it's harder for insurers to have these really restrictive formularies or rely on step therapy or prior authorization. 
but there's a trade-off there because those are the types of things that insurers do to help keep drug prices low. So we can do that, and it will definitely make people's lives easier in terms of not having to deal with all this nonsense, frankly, um, and potentially have lower out-of-pocket costs for drugs, but the, the trade-off there is that the overall cost of drugs are going to go up because these are things that insurers do to help keep the cost of drugs down. So there, it's like we, we can't really have one without the other. There. I'm not saying that it's not worth doing. It's just we should be mindful of what the trade-off is. There are other things that we can that we can do that are being discussed in policy circles right now that are probably feasible in some ways. This is the last bullet point here. So for example, we could have the government set price caps on drugs. We could uh, set whatever our, our drug prices are to what Europe pays for different for the exact same drugs. We could Im it's not on here, but like we could import drugs from other countries. We could nationalize patents and just have the government directly produce drugs themselves at a much lower price than what we currently have. We could, in theory, do all those things, but again, there's a trade-off here, and the trade-off here is that these are the sorts of things that could potentially have a significant chilling effect on future innovation, because pharmaceutical manufacturers, if they see these sorts of things happening, that basically means it's going to be a lot less lucrative in the future to try to produce these drugs, and if you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer and you're thinking about where are we going to put our money for developing new drugs, if we see this sort of, these sort of activities happening for MS drugs, pharmaceutical manufacturers might be less likely to continue to put money in new, into developing new drugs for MS. Again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things. This is just mindful of what the trade-off is that we're talking about. All right, almost done here. So what's promising around pharmaceuticals? One is that it's getting a lot of attention, both popular attention and in a bipartisan fashion. So far, at least at the federal government level, it's, we've had largely rhetoric, not that much significant action, but I do think that there are possibilities for a way forward, even in a polarized political environment here. Uh, I think that we have, policy, we have a strong possibility of passing laws that are going to do a better job of promoting competition in generics and biosimilars, which will really, really help bring down the cost of MS drugs, so for example, the CREATES Act. Um, and in addition, there is, I think, bipartisan interest in, in cracking down on these pharmaceutical manufacturer shenanigans of a variety that will also help potentially bring down the cost of drugs. Um, the PBM market, the pharmaceutical uh, pharmacy benefit management market, is very, very consolidated, and there are concerns that that's also contributing to high drug prices. My view is that it probably is contributing, not in a huge way, but it, it, does, it, it does matter, and maybe we should be like the Federal Trade Commission and it's the antitrust lawyers should probably try to break up that market a little bit. I think that there's bipartisan interest in that. There are ideas around Medicare, uh, sorry, Medicare prescription drug benefits, possibly capping out-of-pocket spending in the Part D program or creating other types of incentives in the Part D program for insurers to do a basically bargain harder with drug manufacturers than they currently do. I think both of those types of ideas have possibilities for traction going forward right now. Um, and then there's the issue of infusion drugs, which is a really, I think, tricky thing because of the way that um, they are treated very, very differently in commercial insurance or private insurance and in the Medicare program. In the Medicare program, it go, that falls under Medicare Part B. So if you have Medicare Part B and you have a supplemental insurance plan, an infusion is probably not going to cost you much of anything. However, if you have commercial insurance, if, you, if you're working or you just haven't qualified for Medicare yet, um, you're probably facing really big restrictions on what the insurer will pay for in terms of these in, new infusion drugs. Um, and I think that, so that doesn't sound promising. Why do I have that under the what's promising? What's promising here is that I think that the arguments for why insurers should not be so restrictive around how they're covering these infusion drugs, the arguments against that are incredibly compelling and strong. And I do think that where there are compelling and strong arguments, that is where there are possibilities for actually making progress. So what can you all do? Uh, again, I'm going to circle back to something I said earlier. You all are the world's experts on the lived experience of having MS and dealing with getting services for MS. Advocacy is so incredibly important. Um, again, circling back to something I said earlier, the way that policymakers think about health policy is, tends to be in the abstract. How, what services should people get if they happen to get sick and at what cost? That's all very abstract and hypothetical. What policymakers really need to do is, uh, need help with is getting the face and the stories of what it actually is like when you are in that situation um, so that they actually can craft policy in a more thoughtful way. Um, we've seen time and time again that when we have organized and visible patient advocacy, it can be incredibly successful. There's a long history of this. So, if you are wanting to make change, like you are the best people in the world to do it. You are the experts. Uh, it has been done before. There are successful models.